Okay, that's awesome. You notice that some of the children that were dedicated weren't babies because their parents received Christ as an adults and the children were older at the time. And um, we had people in that picture that uh, had other religions and some were formerly atheists. And when you see a person get to know Jesus, it's changed so radically like some of them are. And then you see the children there. You think not only did this impact their life, but it impacted the generations to come and impacted their children. And that's a wonderful, amazing thing. Um, earlier, we heard twice someone speak from the congregation words, and the words were given uh, as if it were God himself speaking. When God gives us his word, God speaks to us through it. So sometimes that which is true in the word is given in, in a church service in a prophetic word where we can understand that says, I love you, I I'm glad that you love me, but I want you to know that I love you and I've called you and I want you to take your stand because this world needs you to take your stand in your place. And we've been talking about the Holy Spirit and practical living. And one of the first things that Jesus says is that he'll fill you up with the Holy Spirit so you can be my witnesses. So the word that came today was encouraging us that he loves people and he wants to see them know him and be saved and, and be changed. And God's quite able to do that. And he will use you. And what I have to say today, you can turn to Galatians chapter 5 and be ready to go here on practical Holy Spirit living. And I'll do a little quick brief review. But let me, let me mention that uh, these state fair uh, uh, ribbon fries, which is you a fresh potato cut up in a certain way and deep fried. It's like the greatest tasting thing ever. And, and Dick Galloway, he used to own daddy -O. I used to go out to daddy -O's and get those, re those, uh, those, uh, things. And, uh, I, we loved them. The pastors would all go there and he'd make barbecue and I didn't know him then. And it just cl uh, clicked two and two. Oh, this is that guy. He's been working really hard. Some of our people are volunteering. So if you'd like to stop by at noon on your way and just stop by, we're, we're, we're a tent number five and it's from the, if you know directions, which most, some people go, don't talk to me that way. But anyway, so on the south end, you, you, the, the Lions Park in Urbandale, you know where the shelter, the building is. If you go straight south toward the elementary school and just a little bit uh, over toward the west, and it's, it's, it's right there. Tent five has got a yellow, I think a yellow top, and across the top it says all proceeds go to uh, water wells in Africa. Um, also, uh, I, I wanted to mention that the parade happens rain or shine unless there's uh, thunder or lightning. And my guess is, I, I don't know because the, ch the chairman of the Urbandale Fourth Committee will probably make that decision. If it's pouring down rain, it might not, but it will happen in rain. They've done it in rain before, but we don't want rain. It's a 50% chance it won't rain tomorrow. I, someone just looked it up and it was 40% chance it won't rain. Now it's 50%. By tonight when I go to bed, I want to look at my little thing and say a 20% chance that it will rain or an 80% chance it won't rain. So please pray away the rain. And if it's going to come, make it way later, not during the 10 o'clock parade. And if you want the shuttle to make Pastor Jess Nelson a little clearer, that you, if you meet over at the student campus, we'll shuttle you over to where our floats go. We have this big, beautiful, amazing float for elementary students to ride on and adults can help walk in it and that. And we have a youth, uh, one that we have the youth, they got balloons on and they, they, they're going crazy and it was just a great time. But uh, if you don't have to be there that early, just meet us over on 70th, wherever, however you get there by 10 o'clock. The, the parade starts at 10 and we'll get going. We'd like to get there around 9.30 so we can make plans and so we know what you're doing. But uh, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, so I've been doing these series on the Holy Spirit. Last week, I spoke on the practical Holy Spirit living on uh, spiritual gifts. And in 1 Corinthians 12, in point of review, there are nine spiritual gifts listed there. Three of them are verbal gifts. Tongues, the interpretation of tongues, and prophecy. Three of them are power gifts. Uh, healings, I'm doing it by memory. Healing, miracles, and faith. And three of them 
are uh, knowledge gifts, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, and discernment of spirits. There's nine together. Nowhere in the Bible does it give a definition of what Paul meant when he says that. So you have to have kind of a spiritual understanding deep within you that illuminates and understands what that means. And so when you get full of the Spirit and the Spirit begins to connect through you, as you begin to, in a practical way, be used of God that way, you kind of know it because you go, oh, that must have been the fruit, the, the gift of, 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 uh, of prophecy, okay? So like what happened in church is one thing, but there's a practical gift that when you start getting in a conversation with someone about Jesus and you begin to talk to them and you're being led by the Spirit and the power is on there on you in such a way that you're able to communicate almost as if you're having an out-of-body experience and you're over here with the person you're talking to and you're listening to yourself talk and you're going, whoo, that's really good stuff. Where's that coming from? That's coming from God. He's flowing through you words that are exactly what is needed for that. And I, I know that some of you know what I'm talking about because it's happened to you. And if it hasn't happened to you, it can happen to you. Practical. You see, what we a lot of times happen is we experience a prayer language a spiritual language uh, with the, the, the antiquated word is tongue. A tongue are multiple tongues, plural. And, uh, and then we go, okay, cool, that was cool. You know, hey, I got the Spirit. The Spirit did this. But uh, to walk in the Spirit, Ephesians 5.18 says, to be continuously, be ye filled with the Spirit, the continuous action verb that is a continuous thing. Dr. Nunley, Dr. Wave Nunley said, great sermon, and part of his sermon uh, a few months back was that uh, believers leak. You are a leaky faucet when it comes to spiritual things, and you live in a carnal world, a physical world. And so you need to continuously be filled with the Spirit. So the reason if you've given, been given a spiritual language to use it is to pray because the Bible says that man that prays in a spiritual language builds himself up. You need to be spiritually built up and filled up and help yourself. And, and, and even sometimes interceding, the Bible infers that in spiritual language you can intercede over something I don't know how to pray because it's, I don't understand. So I pray in the Spirit for that thing or worship and sing in spiritual language and worship God in a, in a different dimension. And so that's a purpose of that. But in a practical sense for in the church, he minds us that we need to do everything we do there in a public gathering for the edifying or building up encouragement of the, of others, of believers and don't come in just to, to build yourself up. And in a practical sense of using, using the gifts, it's not having read them, memorized them, understand the three categories of them. Uh, uh, and occasionally in a church, be used uses them, but, but to be, as he says in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially prophecy, because prophecy is speaking the truth under the anointing of God, and that always helps everyone. And so much more that he affirms that one gift above all the others is that he says, you may all prophesy one by one by one, and he doesn't limit how many people can speak God's word under anointing to encourage other people. Hear that? So it's very important. I believe that this morning in the 8 o'clock service that my whole sermon was prophecy. Not prophecy in the terminology because there's another definition of telling the prophetic books like Revelation and Daniel, telling the future, but anointed speaking of the truth of God coming from God through me to others. And I sense that quickening upon me. And so that's another practical place. There's times as a parent you need a word of knowledge. You need, the, you need, or you need word of wisdom. You don't know what to do. And you, Holy Spirit, you tap into that. And God, if you're open to it and desires, he a lot of times just pour wisdom that you go, where did that come from? That's so beautiful. And as a pastor, I have to have God's spirit help me work through me in, in words of wisdom. Uh, so 
there is, there is practical uses to see this Holy Spirit stuff isn't just a study and have a, a, a response, emotional response or anything like that. It's a practical thing we live in and walk in because the gifts of the Spirit are real. And remember, they are the gifts of the Spirit. The Spirit possesses them. He owns them and He uses and flows through you as He wills, severally as He wills. He chooses, so He flows through you. And the way I say this is that if you've ever been used in the gift of healing, then if you tell me that you are the healer now because you have the gift of healing and you possess it, then I want you to go heal everybody because you have that gift. If it's Because when the gift of healing flows, that person's gonna be healed every time because it's the spirit gift and the Holy Spirit's gonna heal that person. It's not an and if or whatever. And then there's the measure of praying and faith and being strong. You pray for people to be healed and they're also healed too. But other times when you just know it, it's like, I don't know how to explain it. That's why it doesn't do a lot of teaching about it there. But you'll know it if you get close and full of the Spirit. You'll know, you'll go, wow, that, flew, that, that flowed through me if you know what those gifts are. It's the practical stuff. And then he says, again, I, I want to remind you, 1 Corinthians 14, 1, to desire spiritual gifts gifts rather you prophesy and when he when in, 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 but no in chapter 12 at the end when he gets through all the gifts uh, back before 13 he says and yet I show you a more excellent way and he's talking about love and in the first part of the love chapter 1 Corinthians 13 he says if you can speak with tongues of men and angels and you don't have love you have nothing if you have all knowledge and all faith, you could do miracles. If you don't have love, it's worthless. You can even put yourself on fire and burn yourself for a cause and sacrifice your life. But if it's not love, it's purposeless. So what love is he talking about? He's talking about God in you, God love. The only way that kind of love is in you is the spirit, fruit of love. And the fruit of the spirit is one word, love. It's agape, it's love, it's God. God is love. It's God in you. When God is in you, your behavior produces love. And that love is seen through kindness. Like 1 Corinthians 13, when it goes on talking about love, that love is seen through patience and kindness and gentleness. It's seen through not being rude and not being self-seeking. It's seen through uh, perseverance. It's seen through uh, hope. It's seen through believing the best. It's seen through uh, uh, not holding on to wrongs and forgiving. All those things are fruit that proves you have love. And that kind of love is not natural or human love, and it's not a religion love. It's not coming from an external force or from your willpower. It comes from the real God of the universe where Jesus has sent his spirit to live inside you, and when that Holy Spirit is strong inside you, that very fruit grows as natural as an apple on an apple tree, and that love permeates everything you are and everything you do. And that's the most excellent way. And in a practical sense, being walking full of the Spirit, in, in a practical sense of Holy Spirit living is love. And I will tell you, if I was never used in any of the nine gifts, if I could love the way God loves, I would be so thankful. And I believe that the one thing God has given me as a pastor is an overwhelming measure of love, so much so that I'm sometimes too gracious, sometimes I'm too merciful, and, and in some ways, I don't know how to explain that because there is, just listen to what I'm saying. I'll say it this way. There is a balance of truth and he's the spirit of truth. There's a measure of a balance between love and truth. He's the spirit of truth. Thou shalt and thou shalt not, and there's truth. This is what God has said and he confronts us with the double-edged sword, the sword of the Holy Spirit and truth. But also that you love and you're merciful and you tell the woman caught in adultery that you forgive her and go and sin no more and you will let her be and not punish her as maybe the law required to be punished. His mercy is this, not being punished the way we deserve to be punished. That's mercy. Grace is giving you something you don't deserve and you haven't earned. He's gracious to us. He gives us his love and forgiveness in his life. So in a practical Holy Spirit living for the spiritual gifts, it's important. This, and so today I just want to go through Galatians chapter 5 and talk to you about, um, 
true liberty, practical Holy Spirit, uh, and then true liberty uh, is the subtitle uh, of this. Our forefathers fought for freedom. They made mistakes. I'm not saying they didn't, uh, but freedom in any nation comes with a price. If you are afraid to fight, you'll lose your freedom because there's always the enemy who wants to dominate you and make you a slave. Your spiritual enemy is Satan who wants to make you a slave and bondage to religion or to sin. For the Jews in this chapter, it was religion. Listen to me. They believed the Jews, it was a part of their religion that had symbolism of circumcision. When Jesus came, he came to the Gentile and the Jew and circumcision did not fulfill what you needed to be. Everybody didn't need to be circumcised to be a follower of Jesus. Okay, and so it was a problem because some of the teachers came along and started putting the guilt of religious practice upon some who were free in Christ and received Christ saying you got to be circumcised. And Paul was even being persecuted, we'll read here and see, because he was preaching that no, you don't have to be circumcised. The salvation is by grace through faith, that it comes through Christ within, through Jesus Christ within. Sometimes this microphone gets cut off the where I'm holding it, so I apologize. It keeps cutting out a little bit. So um, pick up at uh, Galatians chapter 5.1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. You may not have heard the word of the Spirit that, you know, but basically it was saying this very verse is that liberty, true liberty, comes through Christ. Independence is in Jesus, and He has made us free. You see, soldiers have fought and died so that we could have national freedom and freedom of worship and speech, and press, and etc. Jesus died that we could be free from oppression and free from the law, free from our own self-effort. He came to set us free from all of that. And he's talking about particularly circumcision. And he doesn't want us to be entangled with that yoke of bondage of religion. You see, I could try to get you to behave right by getting up here and breaking down every sin telling you every little thing to do, everything to watch on television and not to watch and every movie to watch and not to watch and uh, every detail of what you should and shouldn't do. And, 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 and yes, the Bible lists certain kinds of sins, but there's too many things that you could, you'll never do. And if you're focused and you're looking at sin, you're not looking at Jesus. You're looking at what you shouldn't do. You, you're not looking at what you should do. And when you're spirit-filled and Christ is within and the Holy Spirit leads you, he'll lead you in the truth and how to live and you don't have to be caught up with just struggling and fighting and struggling to do everything right and not do anything wrong. And some people have been raised with discipline and they're good people and it becomes pretty easy not to commit the ten, big 10 sins, you know? They do pretty good with all of that, but... They, they, they may be caught in religious practice and a discipline. In fact, you're talking about the first Corinthians saying you could give yourself to be burned and if it's not of love, it's nothing. It actually happened. Time Magazine carried a picture of a guy that died for a cause, set himself on fire in the middle of the street. It's a famous picture. There he is burning, burning himself. And it wasn't anything to do with God. False religions do all this kind of stuff. They contort, they beat themselves, they climb up mountains to pay for their sin. They do all kinds of stuff to try to please their God and they try to make themselves be perfect. They have to ritualistically get, you know, go and face a certain direction and so many times at a certain hour do certain things. But that's not the, what the spirit of Christ is. That's not what Christianity is about. It's about being free from all that religious practice and religion that is in full of bondage and self-help. You see, uh, uh, you know, we, we, want it. we want goals. We want, to, we want to make religion a goal. We're going to do this. And God has grace. God has his power. And, and God is good. And so we try to live by the flesh, but to, to be good sometimes, but God has given us a spirit where it ought to be natural and easy and flowing. You know how easy it ought to be? It ought to be where you hear God and the Holy Spirit's leading you, that he's right with you and you're aware of it, so you gotta be aware that God is everywhere and he's with you, and so that if you get a thought, 
He's right here. He says, no, don't think about something else. Because what does the Bible say? Whatever things are pure, lovely, just, holy, think on these things, right? And so he's right there and you start to go somewhere. He said, no, don't go in there. Because he'll convict us of sin and righteousness and judge it to come. He will lead us. So it's not difficult because you don't have to decide what you're going to do and what you're going to do because you've got someone inside you speaking to you and directing you and he'll correct you. And, and I can't go with you and everything and go, well, what am I supposed to do with that? Well, pastor said, don't do this, don't do that. No, I don't want to be in your head. I want Jesus in your heart. I want the Holy Spirit to lead you. That's Holy Spirit practical, led, living life. That's, that's what it is. We need the Holy Spirit to help us. And we don't need to be just, just have the weakness of religion. So the practical Holy Spirit living is walking spiritually, being spiritual in your walk or in your living. And by the way, don't take this wrong. But nowhere did I hear Jesus say, this kind, talking about a demon possession, goes out but by speaking in tongues. He said, this kind goes out but by fasting and prayer. You see, your flesh is going to be strong, and most people live every day in the natural, and the things we do, while they may not be sinful, they feed the flesh. Okay, unless your fellowship with people, you're hanging out with people, and the conversation is building Christ, and you're sharing Jesus, then you only have human interaction, and that's, that's, that's not doing anything spiritually for you. And entertainment, and sports, and food, and uh, even work, everything is to provide for that which we touch and we can see, and it's all in the natural, it's the flesh. And most people live about, that are really good Christians in America, are about 50% live uh, fleshy, and not, I don't mean sinful, but I mean fleshy. Some sin maybe, but I'm, I, when I say flesh, I mean in the natural, and other, about 50% spiritual, and maybe not that much. So, if you're going to have the spirit stronger, you've got to crucify the flesh. You've got to starve the flesh and feed the spirit. That's why Jesus lived the fasted life. And that's why when he needed power, he said this kind goes out but by prayer and fasting. And he's like puzzled and almost insulting when he says, when will you ever learn? And so let me tell you something. If you want to walk in the spirit, you've got to be spirit-minded. You see, the things you can see and touch are never going to do anything for you in a spirit realm. That's why you've got to close your eyes. You've got to shut out the physical. You've got to tune in to the spiritual. You've got to tune in with your ear of your spirit and listen so that God will help you and can help you by walking beside you. And that's what Paul is saying here. Don't be caught up in the bondage of not doing, any, not doing these things that are wrong because then you only up, not end up religion being what you don't do because the Holy Spirit wants to lead you into what you should do and you don't want to be sin focused, you want to be Jesus focused because you get to looking at the sins that I already say that, I must be saying it again for a reason, you got to be Jesus focused and want more of God and his spirit. He says in verse two, behold I Paul say to you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. The half brother of Jesus, James said, he said this, he says, if you, if you think you're justified by the law, if you break one point of the law, you're guilty as if you broke all of it. If you're gonna be justified by following right and wrong perfectly, then if you commit one sin, you've blown it. If, you, if, if your formula to being right with God isn't Jesus Christ and his righteousness alone, you're in trouble. You need focus on Jesus, that's what he's saying. You're a debtor, and he says, and he says the, the royal law is this, and it fulfills the law. Thou shalt love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's James chapter 2. That's the brother of Jesus, James, who said that. And now Paul says in verse 4, he says this, in verse 3, he says, I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he's a debtor to the whole law. For Christ has become no effect unto you. Whosoever you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. For though... For we, though the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Notice that faith works by love. Faith, faith works by love. You cannot follow Jesus. Faith follows Jesus daily. Faith isn't just belief. 
Faith is an action, the power of God's grace that does something inside you where you know who you believe and you're persuaded he's able to keep you until that day. Faith is a strong thing. And when faith is, true faith is there, it's because God's spirit is there and you've been born again. And God's spirit is love. It's the power and fruit of love in your life. And therefore, it works by love. Faith always works by love. You did run well. Who did hinder you that should you not obey the truth? He's going, you were doing good. Who, 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 who threw this bondage back on you? Verse eight, this persuasion cometh not of him that called you. It come, didn't come from God. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. By leaven, leaven is yeast. Leaveneth the whole lump, it means when a little sin, leaven represents sin in the Bible. Yeast represents sin. A little sin gets in, it begins to affect everything. Why do we take Communion with unleavened bread. Why was the Passover with unleavened bread? Because the bread could have no sin because of what it represented. And Jesus make it the body of Christ, who Jesus who was sinless and therefore the bread was unleavened. And I believe, no matter what you believe about other pieces, that, that the, 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 the wine that Jesus served for communion in his last supper, it was not leavened wine. Leaven is yeast. You cannot make alcohol without yeast. And his blood would not be represented by leavened juice, leavened juice, because he was perfect and sinless and that blood washes away sin. And therefore, that's just my opinion. You don't have to agree with that. That's just a little extra. It's worth about two cents really because it really doesn't matter of the Holy Spirit full life, but just point. A little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. He's saying be careful about the false thing that puts other, uh, something other than Jesus as your savior. I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. In other words, that person has given you this, this yoke around your neck of being circumcised of the law and being to the letter of the law. You know, shame on them. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. In other words, Paul is saying, I, I get persecuted because I preach the cross and preach faith. Why are they doing that if I'm preaching circumcision? I'm preaching against it. It's proof. It's wrong. V verse 12, I would they were even cut off from, from troubling you. In other words, I just wish they'd leave you alone, get out of here, go to Texas. Verse 13, for brethren, you've been called to liberty. Listen, we have been called to liberty. We're set free from the religious practice, from the external powers that might cause us to be good. That's every other religion that has no power and their God is dead. All other religions are, are external controlling religions that control their people. Do you hear me? The difference is God himself by his spirit has sent him into your life and from the internal, internal being, there's a guide, a voice, a strength, a leading of the living God by his spirit that is sent into our lives. You've been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. In other words, your, your liberty, you don't have to focus on the law and get all focused on that. He says, but it's not that you sin. You don't call the liberty sin. It's that you don't have to focus on sin. You can focus on Jesus. Because you sit there and only use not liberty as an occasion to the flesh, but by love to serve one another. There it is again. The people who have the spirit have love. They serve. They prefer one another in love. They care about others. They pray about others. They use their gifts concerning others and not saying, look at me. Listen to me. Look what I can do. No. It's about others. It's about Jesus. Jesus, others. First, first and foremost. For it says it, and again, Paul says what Jesus said, for all the laws fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself. If you love your neighbor as yourself, you're not going to steal from them. If you love your neighbor as yourself, you're not going to lie about a product so you can sell it and make a profit. If you love your neighbor as yourself, you're not going to, you're not going to uh, uh, lust after their wife or commit adultery with their spouse. You, you hear what I'm saying about here? You know, if you love, if you love your neighbor as yourself, you're not going to look at women that don't have clothes on and so forth so that uh, you're looking at someone else's daughter. You're considering if there was no money to be made in it, they wouldn't do it. Uh, even if you, there is no such thing as free when it comes to internet sites that are, that are filthy. No, no such thing. So, 
Love your neighbors yourself, but if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you not be consumed to one another. I say, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You see, the desire to sin will not be fulfilled. The flesh that wants to sin, the flesh that wants to be full of pride and full of the lust of the eyes and things you see and living for this world and all it gives, it won't be fulfilled if you walk in the spirit because the spirit, when you walk in the spirit, you're attuned to the spirit, you're sensitive to the spirit, you're not quenching the spirit, you're not, you're, uh, you're uh, welcoming the Holy Spirit you're, and you're being led in what God has given to you and being corrected and being, and being urged by the spirit and brought in the truth. And therefore, that Holy Spirit is, is you're, when you're led that way, you're not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. You're not going to fulfill it. For the Bible, verse 17, for the fl flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, they're contrary to one another. And so you cannot do the things you would. And I'm telling you, the secret to power is to fill up with Jesus. And the secret of filling up with Jesus is quit filling up with the things of the world and the natural things, but supernatural, the God of the universe, the Holy Spirit, his word that's a living word and not just doctrinal history. It's a living, it comes alive in you. For the flesh, verse 17, lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh are contrary to one another. They're fighting, they're warring, so you cannot do the things you would. But if you let, be led of the spirit, you're not under the law. If you're not led of the Spirit, you are under the law. That James, that's James Weaver. If you're led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. If you are not led by the Spirit, you don't listen to the Spirit, you're not paying attention to the leading Spirit, you're not listening to the correction, to the voice of the Spirit, you're not aware that God's there, the impressions he makes real upon you, then what are you doing? You're living according to the flesh. You're weak. You're not, you're not, you're, you are under the law then. You better be good. And you're not going to be good enough, I'm sorry. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. And I'm going to read them in the, King, the, 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 uh, the Living Bible over here, but they're in the, on the screen in the King James, verse 19. The acts of sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, which involves pictures that are wrong, thoughts that are wrong, Jesus said. Impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, even in the church, whatever you do, it can't be about you. You don't own it. Dissensions, talking about people behind their back, shame on you. Factions, got your little group, your group talks about other groups. Divisional, de denominational hatred. Envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, those that live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. I don't care what you feel, emotions are emotions and it does not justify or make you right before God because you feel close to God. I don't care how close you feel to God, if you're living in sin, you're not close to God. Are you with me? It's that simple. Then, if you really want to get what Paul's saying, he's saying this, and if this is the crutch, if, if Paul were here to say, I'm gonna say it again, <laughs> the royal law is fulfilled this. You love your neighbor as yourself. He's going to say, but the fruit of the spirit, this is the flesh. The flesh has got many more things than Paul listed, but the fruit of the spirit and the fruit of the spirit has many more things than he lists. And he says, the fruit of the spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness, self-control. Against this, there's, there's no law. And those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. We need to crucify the sinful nature. In other words, guys, you don't have to do anything to get a sinful nature. But to get more of the Spirit and more of God, you've got to do something with that sinful nature, that flesh, that natural man. You've got to crucify it. You've got to put it to death. This word will renew your mind. The engrafted, James says in chapter one, the engrafted word is able to save your soul. That word is psyche that goes right to the mind. The mind is your heart. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. When you say the mind, you thinketh, you thinketh in your heart, you're thinking in your mind. The mind and the heart are the same thing. So heart isn't just feeling. There's a part of it, but it's not just feeling, folks. And Jesus saves our soul. He will change you. This word and his Holy Spirit work together and they're powerful. I know groups that don't understand the Holy Spirit. 
They're not bad people. They're full of the word. They chalk full of the word. They get people saved. They live good lives because the word is a transforming power and the spirit quickens it. They've been saved. But there is more deeper things that the Holy Spirit can do. You know what I'm saying? But let's don't just go after the things the Holy Spirit can do over here and forget this is, this is the primary power and source, the sword of the Holy Spirit. It cuts and divides. And I want you to know that I want more we serve a supernatural God with a supernatural Holy Spirit who can do supernatural things in and through us. And the message came that God wants us to impact our culture and bring independence and liberty, true liberty, to people of this world that don't know that. They are caught in religion, and some of you might be too. This morning, I, I'll be honest with you, I was a little disappointed that I said, I think all of us need less flesh and more spirit. And I think we should all respond to this altar. And about 15, 20 people came. I came because guess what this morning? I've been preaching to myself. And I think as the musicians come, we ought to come right down here and say, God, I want more. We won't be satisfied with anything ordinary. We won't be satisfied at all. I lay my life down. I want something extraordinary, supernatural, that which is not physical, that you cannot touch, that you cannot see. In the realm of the Holy Spirit of God's kingdom, his invisible, powerful kingdom that will never end, and may that kingdom invade our hearts with his spirit. Jesus is not on earth anymore. He's at the right hand of God the Father praying for you and me, and he has sent his spirit with Christ by his spirit is here among us. Christ by his spirit is in us, for God is everywhere. But just understand that his spirit will power you beyond what you can measure. I could hardly stand it over here during worship. I was so full. I wanted these kids came forward and, and, and I didn't want to embarrass them because I'm old but I thought I'm going to be right here and I thought to myself I bet you there are hundreds of people that just want to go to that altar right now as the Holy Spirit to say oh God what we're singing is exactly what I want and if you're here you need forgiveness of sin or you want more of God would you stand with me everyone across this place and if you want this you want more of Jesus. Maybe you need forgiveness of sin. But if you just want more of God, you want more of Jesus and less of flesh, you want more of his freedom, the freedom in Christ, then you come.